And it is my pleasure now to uh, introduce some very special people. So as Chancellor Blank said, you know, one of the things we love about the university uh, are, are the people that we have on campus. And tonight, we're going to have the privilege of hearing some, from some of our very best who are transforming healthcare. The faculty members with us tonight are shaping and expanding our understanding of the field of medicine, and they're making discoveries and developing new insights into how we treat infectious diseases, how we care for aging adults, and how we alleviate suffering and save lives through transplant surgery. Barbara Bowers, Tim Buny, and Robert Redfield are changing lives with their work, and the breadth of their involvement with research, education, and outreach and the depth of their expertise exemplify the importance of faculty to a public research institution like ours. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Tim Buny of the UW-Madison School of Pharmacy. All right, uh, first off, I'd like to just extend a warm welcome to all of you tonight. Um, it's a little bit unusual, but I'm, a, I'm actually working off script tonight. Um, but apparently, my understanding is scripts are quite good at suppressing the long-winded phenotype of some scientists. So, so we'll see if we'll see if that works tonight. Um, but now, no, more seriously, what I'd like to discuss tonight is is drug, multi-drug resistant infectious disease, and and. Part of the driving force for me discussing that is that we're on the verge of a public health crisis. And, and so I'd like to just start from this point, which is an article from the Scientific American in 2017. And it's really highlighting the fact that a woman died from an infection that was resistant to 26 different antibiotics. Okay, and there's a, there's a couple of important points that, that come to mind here. And one is that we now encounter infections that are resistant to all available antibiotics. Two is that the pipeline for new drugs really lacks the chemical diversity to overcome this, this resistance, okay? And so there, there are predictions now that, that suggest that, you know, we're looking at maybe 10 million deaths annually by the year 2050 from drug-resistant infectious disease based on our current trajectory. And um, so my research team is really, I mean, what we're trying to do is change that trajectory. Okay. So another thing that was published in 2017 was a report from the World Health Organization. And, um, and this report highlighted two aspects. One is it, it really talked about the most important critical drug-resistant pathogens out there. The other thing that this article did is really outlined and investigated the clinical pipeline. And, and really, the World Health Organization found some fundamental issues with the, the, the drug pipeline as it exists today. And the problem is that that pipeline lacked chemical and structural diversity, okay? And, and in other words, many of the molecules in there basically looked rather similar to antibiotics that we've used in the past. And this presents a situation where we're going to observe resistance much more quickly than, say, if those molecules looked completely different and had completely different mechanisms of action. Okay, so, um, so this brings about, you know, what I'm focused on in research. And the idea is that if we could find new molecules with new mechanisms of action, we're gonna have a much higher likelihood of overcoming resistance. So my focus in my research program is really identifying new chemical diversity from nature. And so first off, I'd like to step back for a second and, and just talk to you a little bit about where antibiotics come from. About 75% of all antibiotics actually, the molecules can be traced back to having origins in filamentous bacteria such as the one shown here, which is Streptomyces silicolor. Okay, and members of the genus of Streptomyces have been cultivated from soil samples around the whole globe. And these have been thoroughly investigated for antibiotics. 
Okay, the, the problem today, it's not that there aren't new antibiotics that you could get from these organisms. The fundamental issue is that you have to look at 100,000 of these to a million different bacteria to find one new molecule. Okay, and if you know anything about drug development, most drugs fail in the development stage. So at the end of the day, this is just simply an unsustainable practice. On the other hand, my lab has discovered three new classes of molecules from investigating as few as 36 bacteria from marine ecosystems. And, and really what this says to us is that, you know, the marine environment in this e new ecological niche represents one pathway to discovering new chemical diversity. Okay, so how did I end up studying marine bacteria? And I'd like to segue a little bit into my journey with regard to studying marine bacteria. And the structures here highlight aspects of that journey. Both structures demonstrate incredible chemical architecture. That, of course, um, intrigued the chemist in me. Both of these agents are actually clinically approved anti-cancer agents that were discovered from marine invertebrates. Okay? And, but the issue surrounding chemistry for marine invertebrates is that it's really, really difficult to get sufficient quantities to go through the development pipeline. It's simply impossible to go out and collect enough of these animals off of a reef to, to actually get enough of the molecules. Okay? However, over the past 20 years, what research has shown is that molecules such as these are actually produced by symbiotic microorganisms within the whole marine animal. Okay, so, and in fact, Yondolus that, that's shown up here, the precursor is actually manufactured through fermentation of a bacterium, really solidifying the roots of this molecule being produced in the whole animal by a bacterium. So as a result, I wanted to investigate the symbiotic bacteria in marine invertebrates when I started my lab here at UW. Okay, so my lab actually, we go out, we uh, sample marine invertebrates, such as the one shown here, and we cultivate bacteria from these invertebrates for the purposes of drug discovery. It's been one fundamental question driving technology development in my lab, and, and really that question is, how can we assess and model the chemical diversity from these bacteria and really, you know, analyze this in a, in a much deeper sense? So the, the answer to that question, if you think about what I mentioned with regard to the World Health Organization, also answers some of the problems associated with the current clinical pipeline. We need more chemical diversity. So over the past nine years, my laboratory has worked on technology development to assess and to mine chemical diversity from marine bacteria. Okay, and I'm not gonna get into too great a detail about how we do this, but just to give you a little flavor of what we do, our approach uses high-performance liquid chromatography, or HPLC. This allows us to separate the molecules that we isolate from the bacteria. And then we, we use that in conjunction with mass spectrometry. So essentially, we use HPLC to separate all the molecules from the bacteria, and then we analyze each of those molecules by mass spectrometry. And mass spectrometry today gives us such accuracy with the measurement of the masses of these that we can actually say something about the chemical composition. So now you can envision that we can use computers to go through, analyze these data, pick out the compounds, we know something about the chemical composition, and now we can apply statistical models to the data and really find bacteria that are, you know, statistical outliers, something that really stands out. We get some signature that tells us, hey, look, this bacterium is really different than the rest. Let's have a look at that. All right, so one of the most interesting bacteria that we've found today um, we, we discovered through this process, and it was a bacterium isolated from this marine invertebrate shown here, which is called Ectinocidia turbinata. And what is important about this bacterium is that we discovered it from analyzing, again, only 36 different bacteria. That's in contrast to the 100,000 or million that would have to be assessed using traditional methods. 
One of the interesting molecules we found from this, this bacterium that came from this invertebrate is a molecule that we named forazoline. And forazoline was a new antifungal agent and also had a new mechanism of action. It had an incredibly interesting structure. These are the types of features that we think are necessary to overcome current clinical resistance. Okay, so we could apply our methods to marine bacteria. We're, we've been able to discover agents in an antimicrobials at a significantly higher rate compared to traditional approaches. However, we're always limited in comparison to the number of bacteria that we could actually cultivate. We always felt that we really need to analyze all of the bacteria that we have. So I had some ideas, um, you know, because we were sitting at a point where we could analyze groups of about 30 to 50 bacteria reasonably well, but we had thousands in the lab. We could cultivate thousands of interesting bacteria. We, how are we going to analyze all these? And so this was really the critical juncture, I think, in terms of building a sustainable discovery pipeline. And I've, I had some ideas about how we might do this, um, but, but there were some challenges going forward with that. Finally, I got the right graduate student, and a graduate student by the name of Sharia Chanana joined my lab. And he was really interested in programming. And so I was able to talk to him about my ideas and you know, discuss these ideas. And he was actually able to go in, write programs to do what I wanted to do, and actually build this pipeline. And, it, and this has only happened in, over the course of the last few months. But now, we can actually analyze thousands of bacteria, which I think will generate a pretty sustainable pipeline, at least for the near future. Okay, so the grand question, of course, is how does this really impact the drug pipeline? Are we seeing a number of molecules with promising activity in in vivo models? And to answer that question, we've evaluated a number of the molecules that have been discovered from my program in animal models of infectious disease. And out of 61 that we've tested, 36 of those showed some effect in animals Many showed impressive activity against either our model fungal pathogen, Canada albicans, or our model gram-negative pathogen, E. coli. Okay, and the, the data shown below or uh, behind me here indicate a measure of how well the molecules work by measuring the number of colony-forming units that are in the animal after treatment with either an antibiotic or an antifungal agent. Okay, and on the plot behind me, there's a line through the center. That's the group that has, been, has not been treated with anything. Okay, so that gives you the baseline. All of the dots and the data below that line are representing molecules that show efficacy in an animal model. And, and really what this data shows is that we have a large number of molecules, many of them showing significant in vivo efficacy against some of these really nasty pathogens. I'd just like to mention that the data generated here was done in collaboration with Dr. David Andes. David is the chair of the Department of Infectious Diseases here in the medical school. It is also worth noting that the animal models for infectious disease actually recapitulate efficacy in humans quite well. Okay, so finally, I would like to just highlight results from a molecule that is further along in our pipeline currently moving forward on patenting a molecule that we named turbinmyosin. And turbinmyosin is effective against the fungal pathogen named Canada auris, also known as the killer fungus. Okay, this is a really nasty pathogen. And the particular strain that we use to generate these data is resistant to all currently available clinic, all clinically available antifungal agents. So it's essentially untreatable. What we found is turbomycin is highly effective in a mouse model and reduces colony forming units in the mouse model, the blue bars behind me, by almost three logs. Okay, and so when we look at these data, we think of a one log reduction as being fairly effective. So we're seeing a three log reduction with this molecule. So as a result, turbomycin is, is a highly promising therapeutic um, for an infection that results in 90% or greater mortality rate in the clinic. Okay, and what's important here is this discovery was driven 
by our fundamental work on mining models of chemical diversity from marine bacteria. So in summary, I think, I'd just like to say that, you know, we've, we've come a long ways in terms of overcoming these critical barriers in the fight against drug-resistant infectious disease through a combination of unique bacteria from the marine environment and analytical technology development. With that, I'd just like to thank you all for your attention tonight.